Okay, good morning everybody. Welcome to the last week uh, of classes. The end is in sight. Uh, where are we and where we're going? Um, we're going to work our way through the last lecture, formal lecture today on cyborg technology. We started it last time. It's a little bit long. Uh, we may or may not finish it today. We may finish it uh, on Thursday. Um, we will finish it on Thursday if we need to, and Thursday is going to be a special class. I appreciate your patience in holding off from checking your devices during class. Our uh, in-class device ban will come to an end next class. Please do bring your laptop or tablet or phone or what have you. Um, when we finish lecture 26, uh, I will set aside some time for you to do in-class course evaluation, so we'll get those. Uh, out of the way, and whatever time remains, we're going to be doing an HCI case study of Twitch Plays Robotics. I, sh I sort of showed you Twitch Plays Robotics uh, a few weeks back. You are now going to look at TPR, interact with TPR from the point of view of an HCI expert, and you are going to tell us uh, novices how we can improve the system for next time. So we're going to do a collaborative user testing of the TPR system. It's up and running. Before class on Thursday, if you don't have a Twitch TV account, please create one uh, so you can actually log in and interact with the system uh, in class. And I'll give you more details about the case study on Thursday. All right, that's Thursday. Uh, tomorrow night, your final deliverable is due, interim video uh, three, where you're demonstrating some extension of your proposed functionality and some nod in the video that you've improved your system in response to some of your user testing. Any questions about that? Yes? It is not. That fourth video is due next Monday night at 11.59 p.m. So before our oral presentations Tuesday morning, the night before, you're submitting on Blackboard two elements, the written report and the final video, which is two minutes and 30 seconds, no sound. On, on Tuesday, uh, I will write up on the board here a list of all 63 names, and we're going to create this YouTube <coughs> playlist, and when your video comes up, you stand up uh, and come to the front, talk over your video, Sit back down and we'll get through all 63 in uh, however much time we have there, a little less than three, three hours. Okay, in order for this to work, you have to submit your video by 11.59 p.m. to give the TA time in the early hours of the morning to stitch this together in a playlist. If you submit your video late, you're not presenting and there will be no grade for you for the oral component of the final project. Fair? Okay. Yes? Uh, for the final project, there's yes. 30 seconds for user testing, show user testing, right? I, I think yeah. so. Yeah. Would, would that be um, from like your most up-to-date version of your... From the most up-to-date version, or some version after your initial user testing. So here, here was the user testing we did back in intern video two. You don't need to show that, but in the latest round of user testing, we now find that dot, dot, dot. That's fine. Any other questions about that? Yes? Um, uh, in the, this one, where we've updated our functionality, Absolutely. that does not necessarily mean that we have a, does that mean we have a new functionality? Or you, you're extending the, the functionality that you proposed. So for example, in interim video one, you were showing us the beginnings of implementing that functionality. In interim video two, your users were interacting with that rudimentary form of your functionality. Interim video three, you're extending your functionality. Interim video four, you're showing us the final product with another round of user testing. Make sense? Any other questions? No? Okay. Yes? Uh, you, you can get rid of the slides that show the progress. That's right. You don't have to walk us through all of your previous work. We don't, we don't care if we get rid of that. That's fine. So when you're creating your final video here, that video is really for your fellow classmates who have not seen any of your functionality yet. 
Sorry. Yep. Oh, oh, user testing progress. That, that's It's up to you how you want to present that. So you might show results from your initial round of user testing, and then the next slide is, here's how the, how the progress graph looked different in this second round of user testing. It's up to you. you it, either way is fine. No problem. I already submitted my intro video to me. And I just talked about how I extended my functionality, and I didn't okay. talk about my user testing. Should I redo it? Redo it. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so there's an explicit request for interim video three to show. It doesn't have to be long. Obviously, you don't have a lot of time, but some nod in there to uh, your user testing. That's fine. So if you've already submitted, send me an email, and I will kick your submission out, and you can resubmit. Uh, does, does that mean um, show? You Something. You've improved something based on user testing. So in the video, you might say you can see here that now there's this visualization because my previous user was confused about this part. That, that's sufficient. Any other questions? No, we're all good? OK, so back to cyborg technology. Uh, you all brought your permission slips because you know you're being surgically implanted with cybernetic technology today. All good? OK. OK. So uh, we started in on this today. I just want to very briefly go back through this because this will orient us for the relatively large number of technologies we're going to see today and maybe tomorrow. A cybernetic device somehow mediates communication between the central nervous system, the brain, and the peripheral system, which is either the muscles of your body or the sense organs of your body. So just a little bit of terminology. I think this was a little bit confusing last time. Um, when we're talking about uh, biological brains, we usually distinguish between the central nervous system, otherwise known as the brain, and then the peripheral systems, which is everything else. Good way to remember this is that's not unlike the peripheral devices of your computer. Your computer is the central processing part of your system. Peripherals are mouse and keyboards and everything downstream from the central system. So your spinal cord is part of your peripheral system. The nerve endings in your fingertips and the tips of your toes, also part of your peripheral system. So down in the peripheral system, there are obviously muscles and also sense organs. You're getting information back from all the different parts of your body. And all of that information is flowing back up the spinal cord and into the central system. The central system does some processing and then sends commands back down the spinal cord to the muscles in all the different parts of your body. The signals that are flowing down from the central nervous system to the rest of your body, those signals are downstream signals. They're flowing downward away from the central system. And all of the sensory information that's coming in from your body and flowing back up towards the, the brain is traveling along upstream neural connections. Right? So we're going to distinguish between downstream and upstream and central and peripheral in this lecture. When we talk about uh, cyborg technology, and this is the kind of confusing part, I'm also going to use downstream and upstream, but in a slightly different way. We can think about uh, upstream cybernetic devices like this, which are obviously closer to the central system. They're capturing signals and sending them on to the peripheral. Oh, sorry, this is the downstream part. We have cybernetic systems that are mediating between the brain and the muscles, but we can move things sort of more upstream where we're cutting out the peripheral system altogether. The brain is sending uh, a signal to a cybernetic device, and it is not going to a muscle group at all. Instead, it's being sent to a prosthetic arm or leg or vice versa. We might also have an upstream cybernetic device, which is bypassing some damaged or missing sense organ. We're going to look at cochlear and retinal implants in a moment, in which the sense organ itself is missing or damaged. The ear or the eye doesn't work. So the cybernetic device is going to capture information directly from the environment, right upstream, and pass it directly into the central system. Yeah? So as we go, we're going to see instances today of these di two different kinds of cybernetic devices. The first kind 
is dealing with damaged pathways, damaged downstream pathways, for example. So perhaps communication between the brain and a set of muscle groups is damaged. So we're going to use a device to bypass that. Or an upstream communication system is broken or missing. It's not possible to collect sense information from the sense organ and pass it back to the brain. All good? OK. So um, we started last time by looking at basically wearable technology. So this is somewhere between sort of a cybernetic device and a wearable technology. This is the Lokomat, which is sort of a walking robot. Um, you put this device on, and then the robot legs walk on a treadmill. And someone who has a spinal cord injury uh, who is not able to walk, the device walks their legs or their body through the motions of walking and hopefully generates the right, generates the right feeling in the legs so that this upstream communication system and this downstream communication system can be relearned and reconnected. Okay, that's the idea behind the locomot. We talked about how it relies on scaffolding. As the subject, as the patient starts to remember how to walk and starts to take over control and do the walking, the locomat becomes more and more passive until eventually <coughs> the subject is just walking and wearing this passive truss and the robot is not doing any of the walking anymore. Yeah. How much, you said you worked on this, right? Yes. How much success has has there been with this? What year was this? A fair bit. This is actually uh, 12 years ago. So there's been a lot of progress on this since, and it's becoming a more or less standard uh, technique in developed countries. So it works. Again, it depends on the subject, right? Unfortunately, depending on the injury, this remembering the, and relearning the ability to walk may or may not work. You can go and have a look uh, at the website for more recent information about this, this device. OK. For scaffolding to work, if you're the scaffolder, which in this case is the locomat, you're the one that's doing the teaching, as the learner becomes better, you have to sense that improvement and gradually remove the scaffolding. What signal, what data would you be collecting from the patient to know that they're getting better at walking? Muscle activity or resistance on when, it tries, when a, the individual tries to move their legs, it'll kind of kick back on the Absolutely. So the locomot might be able to actually feel pressure. Someone is actually moving their leg inside the device. Or alternatively, you may, you may uh, put on EMG patches, electromyography, which picks up electrical impulses give, being given off by the muscles. So as the muscles start to chirp again, as the muscles start to activate again, that might be the signal for the locomot to remove. As you'll notice in the bottom right picture, uh, the patient is wearing the locomot and they're looking at a screen there. What kind of feedback might you show on the screen to help with this process? There's the device itself, obviously. What other information might you provide in this situation to help the patient remember how to walk? like the movements of walking, the movements of the leg? Perhaps, maybe you actually show it. Remember, this is, this is extremely frustrating if you're in this situation, right? It's something that should be not, not just familiar, but as easy as, as easy as breathing, and it no longer is. We need to try and stimulate as many different sense organs as possible to create the illusion that the patient is walking before the patient is actually walking again. What about showing them someone else who's walking? Would Maybe that some, simulate those same pathways. Someone else who's walking, perhaps? What else might be useful here? Uh, more of an emotional factor, but maybe show like a countdown timer, so they can know after 28 seconds we're going to take a break. Absolutely. Not only is it very frustrating, it's very difficult. You're also creating an educational system now. It might be frustrating. Can we make this as positive an experience uh, as possible? One way to do that is to maybe show a countdown until there's a break. The other thing, if you're the patient wearing the locomot, or remember, remember our PACT analysis, we need to think about the person in the loop here. What is the thing you most want to know while you're performing this task? Am I getting better? Am I getting better? 
right? So some sort of feedback in terms of progression. What percentage of the actual walking is being done by Locomot and how much is being done by me? And the game is obviously for me to get to 100% and Locomot to get to 0%. Okay. That's uh, the lower extremities. We looked at the upper extremities, the arms, uh, last time. Uh, unfortunately for uh, people that suffer uh, strokes afterwards when they recover, they often have these muscle synergies. It's very difficult for them to move one muscle group while keeping the other ones uh, relaxed. We could, again, instrument them with an orthosis, so something they wear over the skin. Again, a robotic truss in this case, which holds the arm steady while they're asked to exercise just one muscle group and hold the other muscle groups as relaxed as possible. I won't play the video again, but just again, you can imagine that cybernetic technologies, a lot of the killer apps here are in me medicine, and in particular in rehabilitation. Right? Rehabilitating someone is extremely tiring on the subject and also on the therapist. Right? There's a lot of repetition here. Uh, is there a way that we can try and automate this process, facilitate this process, bring in some HCI, make this as engaging and, and as fun as it can possibly be for everyone involved? Okay. All right, now we move into true cybernetic technology. Now we're looking at devices that are not over the skin, but under the skin. Um, there's some controversy about this, but arguably the first cyborg was uh, Professor Warwick at the University of Reading uh, in the UK. He surgically implanted uh, an RFID tag underneath his skin back in 1998. He was able to do this because the laws on self-experimentation are a little bit more lax in the UK than they are here uh, in the US. We mentioned RFID tags before, radio frequency ID tags. These are very, very simple and small uh, pieces of uh, circuitry. There's no battery on board. They're completely passive. But if you flash uh, a radio waves, if you flash radio waves into an RFID tag, they can extract just enough uh, power from uh, the radio waves themselves to power the circuit for a few seconds and then shut back off again. So you're basically powering them by uh, hitting them with radio waves. Simple, small, implantable under the skin back in the late uh, 1990s. You can go and read a Wired article uh, about that. Um, in 2002, he implanted another slightly more sophisticated device into the median nerve of his left uh, arm. And in the picture there, you could see he would then clench his fist and move, and the signals from this device in the medial nerve was sending signals to a robot arm, which was more or less moving in sync with his own hand. Uh, in my personal opinion, this was halfway between science and a publicity stunt, but clearly it was control of an external piece of technology using technology surgically implanted under the skin. Okay, kind of an interesting uh, set of experiments. It's a colorful character, uh, Dr. Warwick. You can go and read about those early experiments. Is he the first cyborg or not? Difficult to define because what exactly is the definition of a cyborg? Part human, part machine, right? That seems pretty straightforward. How many of you are wearing your smartphone right now? I know I am. Some of you might have a Smith uh, Fitbit. I feel like it needs to be embedded in your system, like in the human anatomy. Okay, under the skin is a, is a cyborg. What about someone with a 3D printed prosthetic arm? Oh yeah, they're cyborgs. Definitely cyborgs. Not under the skin though. <laughs> That's true. I can put my smartphone away. It doesn't feel good, but I can. A lot of prosthetic arms, you can take them off, absolutely. So does it have to be surgically implanted? Does it have to be physically connected to you? Are those prosthetic arms controllable, or are they just like the prosthetics that you see, like that are kind of just, you swing them around? Some are passive. They're not controlled by the brain, but most these days are controlled by the brain. They are active prosthetics. So if they're controlled by the brain, there's something Ah, if a 3D arm is a 3D printed arm is controlled by the brain, does it necessitate 
something being implanted under the skin. The EEG is not under the skin, though. We're going to look at several devices today in which some answers to that question is yes and some are no. So do, is that a cyborg? Is it not? Is it a matter of physical placement of the device? Does it matter whether it's above or on the skin, or is it a matter of dependency? I can go for a while without my phone. Not too long, but for some time. If I uh, lack arms or legs and, have, and, get to, and become dependent on prosthetics, I'm more dependent. If I have something embedded under the skin, maybe a little bit more dependent. It's kind of tricky, right? You can come up with your own definition. The point here is that the line is kind of blurry. Right? As, we, as we move forward with technology, as we stitch technology into the world, and perhaps literally stitch technology into us, that line becomes more and more blurred. As a society, we are growing more and more, more, and more dependent on our technology. Are we cyborgs? Maybe not yet. Again, it depends on the definition. Kind of interesting to think about. Okay, so let's continue on now with looking at some technologies that clearly are surgically implanted. Let's start with cochlear implants, okay? Let's start with a traditional hearing aid. A hearing aid amplifies sound. So a hearing aid, again, is not surgically implanted, but you can think of it as a device which is helping with this communication challenge. We have uh, this communication pathway here. We have someone whose uh, ear is not working, but they still can collect sound. We just need to amplify the sound. So most hearing aids, even if they're relatively sophisticated, all they're really doing is amplifying the sound that is still being captured by a more or less intact auditory system. A cochlear implant is very different. We have an electrode uh, array that is planted under the skin, just on the inside uh, of the bone. And we then have a microphone on the outside which is picking up the signal and transducing that signal from an auditory pressure waves into electricity. So we're going to see a lot of transducers in this class, in this lecture. Transducers take one physical phenomenon, in this case, pressure waves being produced uh, by sound sources, and they're translated into another uh, physical phenomenon, which in our case is going to be electricity. So we're capturing sound by the microphone, and that is being then transmitted across, uh, wirelessly, across the skull into the receiver. So now we have an electrical impulse which is being sent down this rod here and being sent into this electrode array, which as you can see is embedded inside the cochlea, thus cochlear implant. The cochlea has this spiral canal that's filled with fluid. And in a functioning auditory system, when pressure waves arrive uh, at the ear, it vibrates uh, the eardrum, and that vibration vibrates the fluid inside the cochlea. And inside the cochlea are a whole bunch of very small microscopic hairs that are embedded in the fluid. So when the fluid vibrates, a subset of those hairs vibrate, depending on the frequency of the vibration. And those subsets of vibrating hairs send electrical signals to the brain. We're assuming in this case that uh, in an auditory system there is complete or uh, there is complete failure at some part of the system between here and the cochlea. So there is no way for this particular auditory system to vibrate the fluid inside the cochlea. So these electrode arrays, these electrodes, are going to electrically stimulate the hairs instead. So we still have a subset of hairs which are now sending electrical signals to the brain. Got it? What does the subject hear? You know what the microphone hears. The microphone is hearing normal sound, which is being translated into electricity. And that electricity is more or less being sent directly to the brain. What does the subject hear? I suppose that they would kind of have to learn how to interpret those signals as sound. They are absolutely going to have to learn how to interpret those signals. So not unlike the patients that were wearing the locomot or the stroke patients that were relearning how to uh, actuate their muscles independently, someone who is fitted with a cochlea implant is going to hear something 
and their brain is going to have to relearn what those electrical signals are. So this is one of the mysterious things about the brain. The brain doesn't hear or see anything, right? It's receiving electricity from the auditory system or, uh, or your eyes. What, what does the brain make of that electricity? The brain interprets that electricity as about 40 faces out here in my visual field or the sound of my own vo voice as I'm talking and so on. It's tricky, right? How, how does this work if you have, say, like one ear that's completely deaf with a coherent and one that's working fine? Okay, how does this work if one ear is working and the other isn't? I'm now outside my area of expertise. I don't know. Uh, good question. With all of these technologies, of course, they need to be adapted for every patient because every patient is, is different. Okay. Yes, Margaret. So, so it has to sound how normal? It does not sound normal because we are picking up, let's say, human voice. We have someone who's just been fitted with a cochlea implant. We put them in a quiet room. We have the, the, the doctor, the nurse, sitting in that room speaking quietly to that person. The microphone is picking up normal human speech, sending that electrically to the, uh, the electrode array, which is sending electricity to the brain. But the particular electrical patterns that are being sent to the brain are probably different than when this auditory system was actually working. So this is usually for people that could hear and have lost the ability to hear. So you're definitely going to get, the brain is going to get different electrical impulses <coughs> for a given sound, right? So the brain is going to have to do the bulk of the work here. There's no machine learning here. It's the brain that's going to have to interpret that sound as normal human speech. One of the miracles of cybernetic technology is that the brain seems to be surprisingly good at this task. Okay. We don't have, we are not wearing cochlear implants, so it's difficult to know what it sounds like. Here is the best simulation so far of what this actually sounds like. Okay, we're going to play a series of uh, snippets here, and these are snippets of what uh, a simulation of a cochlear implant actually sounds like. And we're going to hear a series of these for different channels. So remember we have this electrode array inside the cochlea. We can put more or less electrodes in there, which is not that different from low or high resolution on a graphics card. We're going to hear basically very low resolution, uh, we're going to hear a very low resolution cochlear implant. We're going to hear just what, what it's like with one channel, then more than one channel, and so on. As you listen, I want you to pay attention to the moment at which you know what is actually being said in this sound clip. So, spoiler alert, it's an actual human speaking. You probably won't notice that at the beginning. How many channels? Do you need until you hear it as human speech? What kind of bed do you use to catch salmon? What kind of bed do you use to catch salmon? What kind of bait do you use to catch salmon? What kind of bait do you use to catch salmon? How many channels did you need until you recognized what was being said? I apologize for the volume here. Twelve, okay. Somewhere around there. Huh? I, you can recognize that it was speech for me around eight. Ah. I believe that you can't like, understand what's being said until twelve. Remember our discussion back about uh, ubiquitous technology and picking up the elements of sound and throwing away the content of speech but keeping the frequency, the pitch, and so on, right? If you get a raw signal, an, a raw auditory signal, there are a lot of clues in that signal as to what the sound is that's inside that 
signal, right? In this case, it was human speech. I kind of cheated because I told you it was. We could have played the game again, and, and probably with just two or four channels, you would have known that it was a single person speaking. You might not have yet known what they were speaking and picked that up with a little bit more detail. Again, this is a simulation. It's very hard to actually ask someone who has an auditory implant exactly what they heard before their brain rewired and was able to interpret sound correctly. The other challenge here is, as you can imagine, this is different depending on the subject. We all have very different uh, fingerprints, and everybody's cochlea is also slightly different, as is the pattern of neural connections between the auditory system and the brain. It's unique for everyone, so one, one size does not fit all. I have a friend who is in, in, uh, uh, who, who received a cochlear implant, and unfortunately for him, when they turned on the cochlear implant, he said it was like the loudest rock concert you've ever been to, times 10. Where's the volume button on the cochlea? If you listen to very loud sound, it's upsetting for most of us, right? It's so loud, but remember that that very high volume sound, from the point of view of your brain, it is nothing more than electricity. Your brain does not hear anything. Your brain is deaf and dumb. It just receives electrical impulses from your eyes, ears, and so on. Some patterns of electrical input to the brain are interpreted as exceedingly loud sound to the point of being painful. He shut himself away in his room for a couple days, and gradually his brain was able to somehow turn down the volume, and eventually his brain rewired and was able to recognize normal speech perfectly, and he could hear, he says, pretty much as well as he did before uh, his ears failed on him. Pretty amazing. Okay, that's a cochlea implant. Let's look at some other approaches. This is another interesting one. Um, this is, again, for people who, uh, in this case, uh, cannot see, but we're not going to look at any uh, visual implants at the moment. We're going to instead try and see with our ears. This is the voice system, or in other words, the V-O-I-C-E system. Okay. So we have, uh, we have someone who cannot see. They're going to wear a special pair uh, of glasses here, and those glasses are fitted with cameras. The cameras can see. So the cameras are picking up what the person would see normally. The camera is collecting what's in their visual field. And is going to then take that, those visual signals and turn them into an auditory signal. And they're going to try and paint a soundscape. And that sound is then sent into earplugs that they can hear. They can hear just fine, they just can't see. So, an interesting device, because it doesn't require surgery, it's just glasses, camera, and earplugs. The magic here is all in the transformation from uh, visual to auditory. Okay, so how do we do this transformation? There's lots of ways you could imagine doing it. In this case, they're gonna rely on something that we've seen before which is visual metaphors, and they're gonna take visual metaphors and turn them into auditory metaphors. The scene in front of you is scanned in stereo. We have the two cameras. You hear objects, the objects that are on your left, they're gonna be turned into a sound that is only uh, supplied to the left uh, earplug. And objects that are on your right are gonna be translated into sound that is sent only to the right uh, ear, uh, earphone. Brightness, how bright something is, we're going to actually going to scan the scene and turn it into grayscale, first of all. Things that are brighter are going to be louder. Pitch is going to be for things that are higher in your visual scene, uh, in your visual field, and lower sounds for things that are lower in your visual field. We're taking visual elements like brightness and position and turning them into auditory elements like left, right, volume, pitch, and so on. Make sense? Again, with training, it turns out that people can learn to do this. 
people that were able to see and lost the ability to see with enough training of the VOICE system eventually report that they can see again. Not as well as they did before, but they see, which is surprising, right? It's not that their eyes are magically working again, but their brain is interpreting stuff arriving on the auditory system as visual input. Absolutely. So there is a huge amount of simplification that goes into this. Again, this is, this is a story from 13 years ago. They've come a long way with this system. There's a lot of machine learning that goes, uh, goes on. We scan the visual scene and we pull out of that visual th scene things that may be salient, things that may be important. Like what? Objects that you can trip on, absolutely, right? Think about the packed analysis approach here. Someone is wearing this. If you are unsighted and you're able to see, but maybe it's at very low resolution, what are the things that matter? Objects that are on the ground immediately in front of you are probably the most salient. Um, either like where the sidewalk is and cars. Absolutely, right? So something about curbs and, and cars and traffic and, and so on. You can't, we're not going to try and translate everything in the visual scene because it would just be an a overly complex wash of sound. We need to pick out some salient items here. So you could increase the volume based on how close objects are? Maybe, right? So here they're using volume for brightness, which actually is often things that are closer to you, right? That's a, that's a good idea, right? Things that are get, becoming increasingly salient there is a fast moving object approaching you. The sound associated with that object, you should probably turn up the volume because an important auditory metaphor is things that are loud are probably important or they should be important to you. Um, you could limit it by like, limiting the distance to like, things that are you. Absolutely, right? So again, we probably have someone who's not themselves moving too quickly. Let's sort of wash out everything that's not you know, one or two footsteps away from them and focus on that. Um, sure. How, how long would it take for somebody to see that? You're going to see because you're going to do it in a moment. We'll see how good you are at doing this. Any other questions before we try? Okay. This is a little bit difficult to do, obviously, because you are not wearing the voice uh, system. What I'm going to show you, or what I'm not going to show you, actually, you're going to close your eyes when we do this. You don't have to close your eyes yet. I'll tell you when. What, you go, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the video in the top right. And as you can see, there's going to be a number of objects uh, in the scene. That's not all of the objects. That's a subset of the objects. And in this video, there are going to be a series of visual snapshots. And I'll play this back for you that you can watch afterwards with your eyes open so you can see what's actually there. So we have a number of objects that are added and removed from the scene. Each object more or less has its own sound associated with it. And you're going to have to try and remember this. We don't have stereo uh, sound in this room, so we can't do the left and right game. So you're not going to be able to tell whether objects are to the left or the right of this image. But as you can see in this example here, some objects uh, are brighter or take up more brightness on average than others. Okay, so some of these objects are going to appear and disappear. So you're going to close your eyes and you're going to try and figure out which objects here are disappearing and which, if any other objects, are appearing. Got it? Okay, close your eyes. Okay, eyes open. How'd you do? <laughs> Want to try one more time? One more time, last time. Close your eyes. Okay, eyes open. Any better? It sounded like something was repeatedly like moving past. Maybe. 
Maybe. Not easy, is it? Okay. Play it again. Eyes open. How many of you got that? How many of you saw the cup? Probably not many of you, right? It's amazing to think that people that are instrumented with this after more than two rounds of training, some patients, again, it depends on the subject, eventually report they can see the cup, they can see the plate, they can see the fork, they can see the knife. Remember that they've seen these objects before, before they lost their vision. And their brain eventually starts to learn that something that takes up 45% of the visual field has about this kind of sound. So they can identif like, identify cup. I, I don't know how, how much detail they can, they can okay. usually they do this in a behavioral setting. So they will be asked to move slowly in a laboratory and there'll be an object in front of them and they will walk around the object because they'll know they might have bumped into it. The object might be a little bit shorter, so they actually walk over it rather than around it. So they must have known something about the height of the object. They're not often able to self-report. They also often say they see something. Now, what they actually saw might be slightly different from what was actually there. Hard to say. But probably with sufficient training, you could get pretty good at this. If you remember back when we talked about our social robots, we talked about Cog that was playing with the fruit in front of it and could see nothing more than motion. Not too different from this. Cog was able to learn a lot about the world around it because it could feel, and in its case, it could see at the same time. Imagine you can feel and hear at the same time. There's no reason why someone trying to learn to use this device couldn't reach out and feel the object on the table uh, in front of them. So they might feel the plate and know that something that feels like this sounds like this and so on. If we were trying to train people to use this device, this is exactly what we would probably do, is try and bring as many of their sense organs to bear on the learning process as possible. Okay. Okay, we looked at uh, cochlear implants. Look, let's look now at retinal implants or retinal prostheses. Okay, so again, the analog here are glasses. So if someone is wearing normal glasses, then their retina uh, is usually working and the optic nerve uh, at the back of their eye is also usually working. We just need to correct the visual field that is falling on the eye in some way using glasses. Assuming that the eye does not work at all, we're going to try and collect the visual scene in front of the subject, again, using special glasses. And you can see in these glasses, there's a camera embedded. So the camera is looking out at the world, exactly where your eyes would be looking out at the world. We take that visual, uh, we take that visual signal and we then send it again to a five by five or 25 by 25 electrode array, which is sitting at the back of the eye, which is where light would normally fall. So no light is reaching the optic nerve in this particular case, just electricity. So it's like the cochlear implant. In the cochlear implant, we were capturing sound, translating it into electricity, and supplying that electricity directly to the auditory nerve, which feeds into the brain. In this case, we're taking sight or vision, a visual input, translating it into electricity and supplying that electricity directly to the optic nerve. If all we have is a five by five, uh, a five by five array, we're probably not gonna see much, very low resolution vision. Uh, by 2010, uh, they were hoping to get to 25 by 25. They got there a little bit later, and they're now getting higher and higher resolution. What would someone wearing one of these devices see? Based on the, just by the previous example, it wouldn't be the image that you would see. Absolutely. It is something very different. 
right? And again, the brain is going to have to try and figure out how to interpret this correctly. Exactly. So is it even pixelated, right? Can we assume that they're seeing a 25 by 25 uh, matrix of something, right? Hard, hard to see, hard to say. It's not really well known exactly how the brain interprets what's arriving on the upstream auditory nerve, on the, the signals that are flowing up. Absolutely, it's going to be low resolution something. Hard to say, hard to say what. Okay, let's have a look at an example of uh, a, a version of this from 2015. This is what the world looks like to Ray Flynn. His central sight is gone and he relies entirely on... I apologize on the volume on this one. Can you guys hear this in the back? This is what the world looks like to Ray Flynn. His central sight is gone and he relies entirely on his peripheral vision. Ray told me it severely limits what he can do. Hi, Ray. I can't use the cash machines. Quite to be able to go. Ah, good call. Is that going to work? Ah, yes. This is what the world looks like to Ray Flynn. His central sight is gone and he relies entirely on his peripheral vision. Ray told me it severely limits what he can do. Hi, Ray. I can't use the cash machines. I'd like to be able to go shopping and finding things and doing my own pin number in the mail, but my brother has to do all that. He does everything. I'm going to look at the back of your eye. Ray has dry, age-related macular degeneration, AMD, which affects mainly the elderly and happens when cells in part of the retina become damaged. A few hours later, the surgical team at Manchester Royal Eye Hospital are ready to wrap this, the retinal implant, around the back of Ray's right eye, a world first for his condition. Age-related macular degeneration is the most common cause of sight loss in the developed world. At least half a million people in the UK are affected, so there is vast potential for any technology which can improve visual function and enhance quality of life. This is how it works. The patient wears special glasses which have a built-in video camera. The visual information is wirelessly transmitted to the retinal implant on the eye. Electrodes stimulate the retina's remaining cells to send those visual signals to the brain to interpret. Two weeks after surgery, the key moment as the bionic eye is switched on so please close your eyes. Ray is asked to keep his eyes closed during the test so the team can be sure whatever he sees must come from the implant relaying information from the camera on his glasses. Diagonal. Success. Vertical. Horizontal. Oh, it was wonderful with my eyes closed to see the bars on there. It was really good. For his surgeon, it's highly significant. This provides hope to patients with not only this condition, but also to other patients with loss of central vision due to degenerative diseases. So this is just the beginning, and this could be uh, the beginning of a new era. Implants can't deliver fine visual detail like a human eye, but the technology is improving, and trials like this are crucial to the development of bionic sight. Fergus Walsh, BBC News, Manchester. Okay, so I apologize about the sound. Um, he was shown a series of uh, horizontal, vertical, and diagonal horizontal bars, and was reporting that he could see them correctly, right? So it's hard to say exactly what Ray was seeing, but he was seeing something that was close enough that he knew that's horizontal, that's vertical, that's diagonal. The clinician at the end said, obviously, this is just the beginning. In Ray's case, the uh, cells in his retina, right at the back there, the retina that's turning uh, signals into uh, electricity that's sent along the optic nerve, some of those cells are not working. What happens if you have another patient in which the retina is completely 
damaged. There's no possibility there. We want to send the signals directly to the optic nerve. How far up the upstream system that is going from the retina to the optic nerve to the visual part of the brain to the rest of the brain, how far upstream can we place a cybernetic device and still allow someone to see? No one has an answer to that yet. Kind of an interesting thing to think about. Questions before we carry on? Yes? Good, good question, right? So he still has his peripheral vision. I, I'm not sure. Hopefully they designed the glasses so that he can still use that part of his, his vice. That's all right. That's okay. Amazing to think about that, though, right, is that he was doing this test with his eyes closed. Okay. Um, so just taking off the glasses is the equivalent of turning off the device? Taking off the glasses is the equivalent to you closing your eyes. I mean, he still has his peripheral vision, but for someone who doesn't have peripheral vision, that's it. Yeah. Okay. This is another one. Again, this is an older technology, and it's come a long way uh, since then. This one is kind of interesting because this one is a much more upstream intervention. So same thing as before. We have a series. Uh, we have cameras that are embedded in glasses. Those glasses are going to communicate with signal processors. And those signal processors are implanted in both sides of the skull. So we're going to skip over the optic nerve altogether. We're going to send signals directly into the visual cortex. So crash course in the visual system, we have the eyeball itself, the retina, the optic nerve. The optic nerve sends signals to the visual cortex, which is at the very back of your head, the back part of your brain the part of your brain that deals with all visual information, and that information is finally sent to other parts of the brain to integrate your visual input with what you hear, what you remember, what your plans are, and so forth. Yeah. Okay, so we're skipping over the eye and the optic nerve altogether, going a little bit more upstream, and we're gonna send signals directly into the visual cortex. What do people see? Most people who have had the surgery report that they see Phosphenes, you've probably also seen these. So on a sunny day, if you close your eyes, you see these weird sort of floaters uh, in, your, uh, in, in your darkened vision. That's a phosphene. So they tend to report that they see these sort of blobs of light against a dark background. In this case, obviously, they're clearly not seeing anything remotely like what they, uh, is being seen by the camera. So there's a pretty... There's a pretty complex transformation from the visual scene arriving at the camera and what the patient quote unquote sees. So we're gonna use some machine learning here to try and program or train the implant. So the implant or the signal processors are gonna alter for a given scene, they're gonna alter what they send to the visual cortex until if there is some big bright object placed in the front left upper part of the subject's visual field, we keep changing the signal, uh, we keep altering or training the signal processor until the patient reports seeing a phosphine in their upper left visual field. Make sense? Show them, now place an object in their upper right visual field, they say they see a phosphine down here. We keep training our signal processor until they report seeing a phosphine here. Show them object left, object right. They should report a phosphine left, phosphine right, and continue that training and so on. Not that different from what you're doing with your leap motion device and uh, ANN. Okay. Again, this is from a while back. Uh, so the visual, uh, the the visual quality is not very good here. Video quality. Right here. I don't know if we'll get any closed captioning on this one. I don't think so. Something right here. Something right here. Something right here. Right there. Okay. And right in front of me. Right in front of me. Right in front of me. Now I passed him. Oh, now I got him. Now I got the blind. Okay, back to the blind. Little break. And the mannequin right here okay 
So again, a simulation of what they see, it's very difficult for them to actually self-report what they see, but enough that they can sort of know that there's something in front of them. This subject was told, there's a mannequin somewhere close by, find the mannequin, and he is looking around saying, I see the mannequin, now I've lost it, now I see it again, now I see the blind. I don't know if he was told that there are window blinds back there or not. How far can you get with such a system? Was able to very carefully drive and look from my left side to my right side, making sure I was between the row of trees on the right and the building on the left. And when I got near um, any obstruction in the front, I would see that there was an obstruction. I would also see the lack of obstructions. And then when I backed up, I would be able to um, inspect for obstructions there. It was really a nice feeling. Okay. Obviously, a little bit of a publicity stunt there. Probably not going to put someone with this technology on the road, but maybe someday we can, with enough machine learning and a sufficiently high-resolution transducer, recover enough of someone's sight that they would be able to resume daily activities like driving. We'll see. Okay. So that's... That's the visual system and the auditory system. So we're looking at the upstream system, stuff that's trying to come, information that is trying to come from the environment up through our sense organs, through our auditory or visual cortex to the brain. What about the other direction? What about trying to act in the world and influence the world? The reading for today is about brain-computer interaction. Cyborg technology and BCI are kind of mixed, but BCI is usually more about the motor system than the sensory system. Uh, we have someone who uh, is a quadriplegic, uh, quadriplegic. They cannot move their arms and legs. There's very little motion that is possible. Can we instrument someone with technology where all they need to do is think about performing an action? and that action occurs in the real world. How would this actually work? In this case, maybe they're controlling a drone or uh, less, less interesting, they're moving a cursor on a screen, they're moving the steering wheel of a car. What's possible here? How would this actually work? We assume that uh, we have a subject that cannot move any of their muscles, so they're gonna have to send commands to the device. How would we go about doing that? I would assume it's similar to uh, Tom Lee's approach, where you kind of use EEG from like, if you think about moving a muscle, or you think about like going this way, the, the object or whatever you're trying to do. Absolutely. So we're going to use EEG, and we'll look. We may or may not get to Tom Lee's work today. We'll get there in a couple slides. In this particular approach, they're going to use an EEG helmet. So uh, you can see it in the previous picture. They're wearing some sort of cap or helmet with electrodes, which in this case are going the other way. They're picking up electricity from the brain and then pushing it downstream to something else, in this case, uh, a drone. EEG or electroencephalography is fine, um, but its limitation is that it can usually only capture information from a few millimeters under the skull. So we're only able to capture electricity from the surface of the brain. Luckily, through uh, some fluke of evolution, most of our motor system is in the surface of the brain and it is located in the motor strip. Uh, if you wear a pair of earmuffs or uh, headphones and the strap of, that, of the earmuffs would lie exactly along your motor strip, which is this strip right midway back uh, across your skull, you have one part of your motor system on the right side of your brain and the other part on the left side of your brain. And uh, the motor strip is quite famous in neuroscience and beyond because it houses the motor homunculus which is this little cartoon that you see here. The homunculus is an idea that's been around for a long time in neuroscience. How do you think? How do you act? How do you get around in the world? Where clearly there's a little man inside your brain that is moving all the switches and, and looking through your eyes and so on. There's a problem with the homunculus description of uh, brain activity. What is it? It attributes a single part of the brain to a single. That's one problem. There's many problems with the homunculus view. 
So if I tell you the reason you're able to think and act and see because there's a little man inside you who is doing the thinking, thinking seeing, and acting, who controls the homunculus, right? And the usual answer is it's homunculi all the way down. <laughs> all right. You can go read about the homunculi. For our purposes, we're going to focus on the much less magical motor homunculi. The motor homunculi is not actually a little man. It is a map of your body uh, across that motor strip. Uh, and so you'll notice that different parts of that motor strip are responsible for controlling different parts of your body. That's kind of obvious from the cartoon. A couple of twists here. The right side of your motor strip is responsible for controlling the left side of your body, and the left side of your motor strip is responsible for controlling the right side of your body. Why are some parts of this cartoon bigger and some smaller? That means we have more problems. You have more processing power for controlling that part of the body. One key to human intelligence is this particular finger, our opposable thumb, for fine motor control. Think about all the different things you can do with your hand, partially thanks to your thumb. Look at the size of your hand in your motor homunculus or homuncula compared to the rest of the body. Lips are relatively large. Uh, the genitals here are not drawn because they'd obviously take up the whole rest of the screen, as you can probably imagine. All right, there's the, there's the motor homunculus for you. If you close your eyes and I ask you to think about clenching your fist, but you do not actually clench your fist, which part of the motor homunculus here lights up? If, I, if you were to wear EEG, if I were to put you in an MRI machine, which part? This one or this one? Let, clench your left fist. This part lights up, right? The right side of your motor strip where your fist actually is. OK. Imagine that we fit you with an EEG uh, cap. We ask you to close your eyes, and we ask you, uh, in your case, you actually can clench your fist. Imagine that you are completely paralyzed. You cannot clench your fit fist. So I ask you to think about doing it. We do that a few times. Then I ask you to imagine holding two control rods. And you can twist the, this control uh, rod forward or back. So the actions that, you're pos that are possible are this, OK? Which I can then tell whether you're actually imagining that or not. If you close your eyes and I ask you to twist the left control knob forward, and you tell me that you do, and I see this, I know you're lying. You're thinking about twisting your right hand forward. OK. Imagine we then take this signal. We take signals from the motor strip, and we send it to a drone. How should the drone interpret those different signals coming from the motor strip? It's pitch, or whatever you uh, that's yaw. Right? Yeah. Or, sorry, roll. That's roll. That's roll. Okay, possibly. So maybe, maybe we ask you to hold the steering wheel. Maybe that makes more sense and to do this instead. Because if we want to control roll, maybe that makes more sense. Although that's a little tricky now because we have both hands on the steering wheel and we're going to get a more complex signal from the motor strip. It would be better if we ask someone to imagine a different control system where we can do things independently with the left and the right hand. We want someone to be able to drive the drone forward, back, left and right, up and down. And we want to be able to pick up signals when we know that the subject is using their left hand, right hand, or both, or neither. What transformation should we perform from this signal to commands to the drone? We're now we're just purely in software. We can do anything we want. Actually, it turns out with the motor system, things are very easy. It's, it's, right, on the, it's right on the surface. If you think about clo 
clenching your fist, you get a very strong signal in the motor strip. The problem here is not detection of signal. It's we want to try and allow someone to imagine driving a drone and successfully drive a drone in reality. What would you ask them to think about doing with their two hands? Well, this is kind of slightly different, but if they imagine unclenching their fist, yep. is it also awesome with them in the same way? Uh, if they relax their, their fist. If you, if you imagine just to say relax, imagine your, your hand is just hanging loosely, then you get back to what's known as resting state. If someone is just sitting quietly in a chair wearing an EEG, there is a base level of activity. And all of these signals, I'm sorry, I should, have, I should have described that before. All of the dark blue here says this is normal. This is what is normally detected in this person's brain when they are sitting quietly. When they think about doing something, the more red the pattern is, the further away from rest it is. If you ask someone to imagine clenching their fist as tightly as they possibly can, you get a stronger signal, generally speaking. It seems to me like if you use this on a person who could actually clench their fist and they were just, let's say, controlling a drone and they like reached over for a glass of water, would that control the drone by accident? Uh, if, they, if they imagine reaching for a glass of water, imagine these are people that cannot move. But if you use it on someone who could move, but they if actually someone, did? If they actually did, yes. So another interesting thing about the motor strip is if you imagine reaching for a glass of water and you actually reach for a glass of water, you get a pretty similar signal. There's a little bit of difference, but not too much. Our ability to imagine movements, our, motor, our, our, our ability of motor imagery is pretty strong. Okay, back to the drone. Luckily, we don't have to actually create in hardware a remote control for the drone. We can just come up with something, what would we come up with? What's the, what's the most intuitive HCI device you can imagine for someone who can imagine moving one or both of their hands? They need to control left, right, up, down, forward, back. Um, it might seem a little bit silly, but like, if you could, you could uh, put your arms out of your sides so that you were like a little plane, uh, you could put your arms up and further up they go, Larger you wingspan, you have the faster you go. Exactly. And then you could like tilt and just imagine tilting your own body and would translate to how you Absolutely. You remember, you might remember all the way back to the beginning of the lecture, we talked about familiarity. When people create new software and hardware, they usually are biased by what came before. When we play this game about imagining how to control a drone with your brain, most people say imagine a virtual remote control where you virtually move the knobs of the remote control because what is the current state of the art way to control a drone? A remote control device. But now that we're in the realm of thought, we don't need a device at all. We could ask the person not to imagine controlling the drone with a remote control. We could say, be the drone. Right? Whatever that would be. Or with their hand, right? Hand, arm, doesn't matter. Whatever it is, we can usually pick it up with, from the motor strip, and as long as it's relatively independent, they're doing things with left and right independently, we can do it. So is it easier to control a, a drone by just thinking about it, by thinking about a remote control, or by being a drone? Hard to say, but it's an interesting distinction, right? As HCI designers, we should realize we're now in a new realm and there are new possibilities here. We're not restricted by physical technology in this case. Okay, very interesting uh, piece of technology. You can go read about this uh, in the reading for today. Okay, again, we're back to wearable devices here though, right? Someone is wearing an EEG, so we're having to pick up signals on the other side of the skull from the motor strip, which is under the skull. For some people that have a partially damaged uh, motor cortex, we talked about visual cortex, which is the part that's receiving information from the visual system. Motor cortex, or the motor strip, is that part of your brain in which you imagine an action. And you send that to your peripheral motor system, and your arm actually carries it out. If the motor strip is not working very well, if the motor cortex is not working very well, perhaps we embed a signal directly into the motor cortex uh, itself. We again embed an electrode array. Signals from the array, which are capturing stuff from inside the motor cortex, 
translated into computer commands. And again, the patient thinks about what they would like to have ha happen, like moving a drone or moving a cursor, and the resulting signals are sent to the software or hardware. Study participants will undergo a surgical procedure where a small sensor is Study participants will undergo a surgical procedure ah. <laughs> where a small Bear with me. Study participants will undergo a surgical procedure where a small sensor is placed on the area of the brain responsible for movement. This sensor is connected to a pedestal that is attached to the skull and protrudes through the skin. The sensor records electrical signals from the brain, and these signals are fed into a device where they are interpreted by an operator using special software. From there, the signals are fed to a computer through which a study participant will attempt to control a cursor on a computer screen. The goal of the study is to evaluate the quality, type, and usefulness of cursor control that participants can achieve by using their thoughts. Okay, similar idea, but again, we are now looking at implantable devices. What other simple computer commands might you train someone that has this system to perform? Text, maybe. Text. So we're going to have someone enter text rather than move a cursor. All right, that's an interesting one. What should we ask the subject to imagine in order to generate text? Typing is the obvious choice, right? Let's assume that this subject is an accomplished typist and they're going to type. They can imagine typing very quickly. How are we going to do in that case? Is this going to work? Well, how would you, you wouldn't know what you're... Like, how you so think about you? typing, right? We're now we're thinking about the physical activity of typing. We have two hands that are moving. Assuming this is an accomplished typer, they're not doing hunt and peck. They're actually typing. Now again, the motor homunculus is pretty good. You have a lot of feeling in your fingers. You're very good at fine motor control. So we've got quite a bit of neural real estate. But think about someone who reaches out to type uh, you rather than I. So we have to distinguish between imagining this and imagining that. Again, it may be possible, but that's a pretty subtle distinction. I think that you could almost generate like, noise almost from that. So I think it would be better if that's what someone like, on display, like a keyboard. Possibly. So these subjects can see. Maybe we put up a, a keyboard on the screen and ask them to think about reaching out and touching parts of the screen, maybe. I mean, like, autocorrect is able to is able to catch some really, really bad typing errors. So I feel like possibly you had a powerful autocorrect. Absolutely. So maybe it's not clear whether I'm going for you or I, but with good enough autocorrect, maybe this isn't a problem. You might want to have them like yeah. write it out. Ah, right. So think about the task of generating text. Most of us are computer scientists. Not surprisingly, our first thought is keyboard, but you can generate text in lots of different ways. Maybe writing is easier, possibly. Right? What else is possible? What if you do, like, kind of similar to the, the airplane thing, what if you do, like, dumb, like, cheerleader letters? Maybe. <laughs> Those are like huge motions. Absolutely, right? So let's let's make sure we can get a clear signal, right? So it might be that I imagine doing this for a capital A or acting it out. What else is possible? Sign language, absolutely. Sign language is actually not so bad because as you know now, for at least the 10 digits, you're fully extending or fully retracting one of your five digits. That's possible. Ah, do you need to type an A or write an A or sign an A? What happens if you just think about the letter A? Is, are the language centers of the brain also easily accessible? Ah, now we're getting, we're moving now outside the motor strip. I'm not thinking about any particular action. I'm just thinking about the letter A. So we will end here today. 
And that's perfect timing because we will talk about Tom Lee's work, which scans from not just the motor strip, but from the rest of the brain. Uh, you have a quiz due tonight. Interim video three is due. If you came in late, have a look at the schedule. On Thursday, please bring your laptop to class. And if you don't have a Twitch account, please create a Twitch account before class on Thursday. See you then. Thank you.